all right? There's water rights that can be out there. Let's talk about water. Now, when it comes to water, there are two types of waters. The first water I want to talk about is what we're going to classify as a river, all right? And a river has riparian rights. And I did the R that way so you can remember. River, riparian, all right? So here is a river. I've had people say, why'd you draw a highway? It's not a highway. <laughs> it's a river. All right. So in a river, there are riparian rights. However, there are two types of rivers. We have to understand that. According to the United States Coast Guard, there are rivers that have, that can be navigable or can navigate commercial commerce down it like the Ohio River, the Mississippi River, you know, the Colorado River. Those would be navigable rivers. If that is true, then your rights only extend to the bank. So if the river is navigable, yes, you would only own to the bank of the water. Think about this. If it's the government's water, I don't take care of it. Therefore, I only own to the bank. So the second type of river that we want to talk about is one that is not navigable. Not navigable. What's probably a better name for a river that you can't get a boat down? Think about it a stream, a creek, or is it a crick? I always get those confused. If that's the case, then your rights extend to the center thread of that creek. That's how I remember this. If the government can get a boat down it, it's their water. You don't own it, so you only own to the bank. If you cannot get a boat down it, the government doesn't really care, doesn't control it. They leave that responsibility to you. So if it is not navigable, you would own to the middle. And theoretically, this owner over here owns to there. All right. So those are riparian rights that come with a river. They are granted along streams, rivers, or creeks, or similar bodies of water. There is a second type of water. And every type of water falls into one of these classifications. It's either a river or a lake. And as a lake, you have littoral rights. Notice the L in lake, lake, littoral. In littoral rights, you own to the average high water mark, right? Lake Michigan, Lake Okeechobee. The oceans are considered a lake. So while there are people out there that go, well, that's a private beach, yes. That is potentially possible that the beach running right here is private. But a person out here in a boat is in federal water, and they can't really stop that. So that's why you see those paparazzis out there with all the actors out on the beach and taking pictures, because they may not be on the beach. It technically could be private under the littoral rights, but the water is not, okay? So those are the water rights that can be held either in riparian or littoral. There are also, think about retention ponds inside a housing addition, uh, 
things like that. They would tell you on the your deed what rights you have to that, okay? <clears throat> now, you can gain property. Let's go back to this one here. You can gain property through the water moving because rivers move. And if the river moves, you could gain property. Let's say there is some, so let's get a different picture because I don't want you to see that word not on there. So what you have is this river on your property. All right. And you have riparian rights here. Okay. When soil deposits, so you would own to. Let's start this over so that we understand each other. <laughs> got a river, you've got riparian rights. In this particular case, this is a navigable river you own to the bank. So here you go. You own all this property all the way to the bank, right? However, soil could get deposited. So in essence, this water moves this way. And now you actually have increased some land that is called accretion. Accretion. Accretion is the increase of land due to the deposit of soil in a navigable river. Think of the word increase sounds like accretion. Increase or accretion. Now letter B, D, I'm going to skip down here real quick to that one because we know the other one is you could have erosion so this guy down here owned the here. Now he only owns to here, and he lost land through erosion. That is a loss of land through erosion. There is this thing called reliction. Reliction is used in the lake case. And I told you, you own to the average high water mark. Well, let's say there is a reduction in the water through a drought, and you gain land that way. So, reliction is used in littoral rights, where um, <clears throat> accretion and erosion are actually used in riparian rights. There is a fourth term here called an avulsion. An avulsion is a sudden change in the landscape for some reason, like a landslide, a mudslide, a hurricane. Um, if you remember, Hurricane Sandy up in the northeast coast actually changed the ocean line along that upper northeast area of the United States. That would be considered an avulsion. So you've got four terms here that the book is going to love to use. I would use all those in flashcards. Accretion, erosion, reliction, and avulsion. All right? Now, the doctrine of prior appropriation. What does doctrine mean? The doctrine is a right or a law. What does prior mean? Means it's already happened. And the word appropriation meaning that the state has taken control. So the doctrine of prior appropriation states, even though the water is on your land, it is needed so badly by the state that they have appropriated all of the waters that will ever go through that property. Things like the Snake River, all right? It flows down and I believe right into Phoenix, all right? So you own land and go, hey, wait, that river runs right through my living room. It's mine. No, the water, they work under the doctrine of prior appropriation. 
and says, hey, that water's ours because we need it to feed a city. You want to siphon water off to uh, water your plants? You actually have to get permits from the state because they will only issue so much because they need that water through, uh, and they have taken it through the doctrine of prior appropriation. A lot of your East Coast states, Indiana doesn't, Virginia doesn't, Florida doesn't use those, but like all the drier states, New Mexico, Nevada, Arizona, uh, Montana has it, uh, all of those use the doctrine of prior appropriation. Coastal waters, I don't believe there's a lot on the exam. I don't think anybody's ever asked a question to me and come to me and go, hey. Um, so understand that the coastal waters are defined by the, the law of the sea. Uh, I don't think there's any questions that talk about what's the distance, all right? Now, we talked about the three physical characteristics of land a minute ago that it's immovable, it's indestructible, and that's unique, non-homogeneity. Land also has four uh, economic characteristics that give it value. The first one is scarcity. Scarcity is because there's only so much land. We're, that's it, all right? We're not making new land, but there is a finite amount of it. Now, don't panic. I think last statistic I read said we only live on about 3% of all the land. Now, the miss, <clears throat> the fact that statistic, you go like 3%, but understand they're including things like the polar caps, the, all the deserts. So I don't think we could ever live on 100% of the land anyway. Improvements give value to property. So a, an improvement, and what's an improvement? An improvement is actually man-made property, like a house on the property. Now, do not be confused that it could actually unfavorably change the value because let's say there's a property, and I've seen this a lot of times when people go, oh, well, the land is so-and-so, and I'm like, well, it's got a vacant home that is derelict, and you're like, yeah, but the land is worth so-and-so, and you've got to go, no, wait a minute. It's going to cost me $20,000 to tear that house down. So it's actually a negative detractor on that. But it's still an economic characteristic that could change the value either up or down. The permanence of investment. Land will always be worth more in the future. Now, when I say that, please understand what I mean is on the macro scale. So look at the property in like, uh, that was supposed to be a one like 1900 versus the year 2000. Land has gone up and it will always go up under the permanence of investment. You cannot look at it from year to year on the micro scale because what you might see is, yes, there is a certain year where the value may go down, but in the long run, the trend is always to get more valuable. That is called the permanence of investment. There is another economic factor called situs. Situs is the Latin word for location or place. There are areas of the city that people will pay more to be in over other areas. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, that's the key here. You don't know what that reason is. I could name some places in Indianapolis. Broad Ripple is a great example. Broad Ripple's in the northern section of Indianapolis. It's about at 82nd Street. You go into that little 10 or 12 block area, and a house is about one and a half times worth or more than a house that's similar size somewhere else, which we know you can't do because immovable. Why? I don't know. You know, there are uh, um, um, uh, Central Park in New York. Property right around the edge is worth way more than somewhere else. So there are area preferences that will give economic value to real estate as well.
Now, are you a practicing attorney? Answer that question. The answer is probably, for most of you, no. So make sure that you do not practice law. You cannot practice law. The problem is we will deal with a lot of law. There are specific types of law that happen inside of a real estate transaction. We've got contract law. We've got property law. We've got agency law. We've got license law. There are federal regulations that are laws like fair housing and fair credit. All of these laws. Make sure that you don't practice law while you're trying to practice real estate. One of the things you should get used to saying is, hey, I'm not a practicing attorney, but here's what I think. Or better than yet, we might want to reach out to an attorney. Let's contact an attorney. Okay. So do not practice law. Do not write contracts. You are not a contract writer. That is another term that you will hear in our world that is technically not right. Back to the real estate versus real property. There are a lot of agents that call me and say, well, you know, I'm going to go write a purchase agreement tonight. No, you're not. All right. You are going to fill in a pre-printed form and every state does this. I've sold property in three or four different states. They all do this. There is a document set that you can use in Indiana that's written by the Indiana Association of Realtors. Same thing in Florida, same thing in Texas, all right? You are just filling in blanks in a pre-printed form, so we're not really writing contracts. So understand, because that would require a, 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 a barred attorney. That's not right. I don't want to use the word barred meaning negative, meaning a member of the bar uh, attorney, and you are not, unless of course you are. So understand that. There are license laws that we will deal with, and we will go through license laws in this class, depending on what state we're in. And each state has the ability to create their own license law. The purpose of license law is to protect the public. That's the overarching goal of all license laws is to protect the public. So when you get into a test and you're at that state portion talking about license law and you got a question that maybe you get confused on, understand that whatever answer in there, A, B, C, or D, is the most protective of the public. That's the answer because that's the overarching goal for all real estate commissions in all 50 states including the District of Columbia, Canada, and Puerto Rico, is to protect the public. All of the laws are very similar in nature, but not exact. They differ in certain little areas, so we have to understand what state you're in. One of the questions that I get asked a lot of times is, does this education or does this license allow me to practice in another state? The answer to that is definitely maybe, all right? And it, and we'll talk more about reciprocity with states uh, as we move forward a little bit, all right? But I will tell you that almost in every case, you are going to be subjected to taking that state's state-specific laws. If the license is reciprocal, the state law portion almost always is not because North Carolina works slightly different than Indiana, works slightly different than Florida, slightly different than Colorado. So even if the general body is accepted by that state, virtually none of them accept the state laws. So you would have to go in and take specific education for that licensing. Now, depending on what that state says, they may force you to take all of your licensing again. Hey, maybe they don't recognize your license in the state you're in, and therefore, it's as if you have no license. So we'll talk about reciprocity as we get a little bit more. All right, at this point, I am at the end of the chapter, and if in your book, once again, there is a page that I would look at because it would be a great place to uh, add things, 
would be that uh, page entitled Key Point Review. Key Point Review. Now, I do want to go back and catch one thing because I want to make sure we mention the words. Back on page 25, when we were up here dealing with water rights, there's a couple terms that I want to put in um, real quick. I want you to understand there's a thing called a floodplain. Floodplain. A floodplain is a uh, area of land. And there's, let's say, a river. The floodplain is going to be that area outside of that body of water. It could be a floodplain in a creek, a stream, or a river. Could also be a floodplain in a lake. That's the area outside of the river. Please write this in your book. Maybe I forgot to tell you that, but I would really because I want to make sure you understand. There is a second word called flood water. Flood water would be that water that recedes or exceeds over the top that flows into the flood plain. In cases like that, this is where we that house that's sitting here would need flood insurance. It is a separate insurance for specific properties that sit in a flood plain because of flood water. All right? Should have put that in a little earlier, but I got it in before your quizzes. All right. <clears throat> So like I said, there is a section called Key Point Review. You do have questions on this chapter down below, and you have questions in your book, and I'm sure that you can think of your own questions. I want to remind you, if you do have any questions to me about course material, feel free to email me at raymond at realuniversity.com. Email me at Raymond at Real University oops dot com that is my email address that is an envelope <laughs> alright uh, until the next chapter I'll see you then